Mississippi lays claim to some of the best blues musicians in the world, and today's guest is no exception. Grady Champion can do it all. He can write, sing, play the guitar and harmonica, you name it. So good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I Always we, we, we got to stop meeting like this, <laughs> you know. But uh, congratulations! I know this is coming out. This That's is right. uh, the new album. It's uh, one of a kind. Mm. Uh, looks nice. First one with Malico Records. What the second one? The second one. Second one with Malico. <laughs> I'm slipping in my old age, <laughs> but fantastic, and I'm really, really pleased. You're one of the busiest guys I know. I mean, I, I keep up with your Facebook page, That's right. and I get tired. I mean, 180 <laughs> performances a year. It's incredible. Right. Well, I tell you, it's, it's just been exciting, you know, especially after winning that 2010 um, IBC. Yeah. It kind of, like, reopened the door, so I've been kind of, like, grinding and grinding, and now it got to the point where... Maybe when I'm doing 180 now, I was doing 200 and some yeah. some dates. But now I'm focused more on the executive side. You know, exactly. I have a couple of artists on my record label, Eddie Cotton, J.J. Timms. So I get to do other things that, you know, that kind of like get me going. But the blues is in my soul. Well, it's smart, too, because, I, I mean, I know you love to perform, and you're mm -hmm. very good. It's a lot of energy when you're up on stage. But there will become a time in your life, I'm sure, when it would be nice to sit back and say, <laughs> okay, I'm making the cash register ring without having to get up and work until 2 in the morning. Well, that's where you don't put the time into what I'm doing now with exactly. the business side yeah. so that you can get to that that time where right. you can do that. When you know when you get ready to deal with the grandchildren and all that, all that coming, you know. Yeah, yeah. You started in the record business, and you were down in Miami. That's right. And you were doing... You were doing hip hop and rap. Right. You were doing rap, and you were also a boxer. Yeah, well, I'm you not going to mess with you. Number one, you're a boxer. <laughs> but 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 you got started down in that. But you had a chance to work with some record executives too, didn't you? Uh, well, that was, that was the biggest thing. Yeah. See, I didn't get my first instrument until I was 25. Yeah. So I started out into promotion, promoting rap music, and after I was doing the promotion, working with the artists. I was kind of liking what I was seeing on stage, so I wanted yeah. to get on stage. So started out with guys, Suntown Records was the first record label to give me an opportunity to promote. Right. So I learned from the promotion aspect of it first. What, what made you go from hip hop to the blues? Well, when I was about 23 years old, single father yeah. and stuff like that, is that I, I wanted to be in a more mature music because when I was, at the time when I was rapping, you know, you be in a club rapping, you come out, somebody done stabbed somebody yeah. or shot somebody <laughs> back in the early 90s and the late 80s, you know, they weren't playing. And then it was going more into the gangster rap. Yeah. And it not, it's not the rappers, it's the other people that think they gangsters already that exactly. want to live by the word of the song. So, so I just felt like I had to get into a more mature music. And um, and being in Miami, I was listening to uh, Lynn Pay show, yeah. which is at the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, uh, Marshall, uh, listening. I heard Sonny Boy Wisdom on that harmonica. And, and that was like the chess records type thing. Cause being born in Mississippi, we was always exposed to Malico type music. You know, you right. had, you know, Bobby Rush and, you know, um, Little Milton, them, you know, Bobby Blue Bland, ZZ Hill, one of my mom's favorites. So. Isn't it ironic though? I mean, here you, you grew up in Mississippi. That's I right. mean, you grew up right in Canton, right off of Highway 43. Here, Highway 43 South. <laughs> exactly. And I love this because you had, you are one of 28 children. That's right. The baby of 28. Your dad is like, a rock star. I mean, that, that guy ate some Wheaties. 28 kids. I've got three and I'm exhausted. So, but but you, you grew up, and I, amazing, you grew up on the farm. Yes. And you worked your can off. I knew at 6 o'clock in the morning, Mama saying, y'all get up now, it's time to go out there to that field. Because, you know, we did all the harvesting and then Mama and them, you know, they'll bag the, you know, the corn, the okra, mm -hmm. and, the, and the peas, you know, for the, for the winter time. Right. So we, we was out doing that, so it wasn't really like you get you got time to do what you want to do, because you want going out to play until <laughs> that was done. So when the sun went down, basically. When the sun went down, and yeah. then, you know, on, on the weekends, you know, sometimes, especially if we done did it during the week, you know, mama give us a day off or during the week or whatever, that we're able to, you know, just go out and play, go in the pasture and hunt snakes and stuff like that, you know, just what little country boys do. At what age did you discover music? Uh, I, well, I started singing in the church choir when I was eight years old. Okay. And, um, I kind of left it because the girls used to make fun of me because I had this high-pitched voice. <laughs> and they would say, oh, he sounded like a girl singing. So, you know, of course, I kind of shied away and kind of got away from the choir. <laughs> and um, ended up finding the back when 
LL Cool J and all them guys started coming in. I started really digging rap when I was here, even before mm -hmm. I went to Miami. I'd be walking in the pea field trying to rap like LL Cool J now, you know what I'm saying? What got y'all what made y'all move to Miami? My sister actually married a guy from Miami. Okay. And you know, my mom, she wanted to be with her, so she kind of got yeah. picked us up, took us down. I was 15 years old, oh, junior, wow. junior, junior in high school. Yeah. That's what I would tell people. You can imagine taking a little old country boy out the country, yeah. and then you place him into a, a city like Miami. It was like a culture shock. It'd you know be like saying? drinking from a fire hose. Oh, man. I mean, the stuff that was going on in Miami, it wasn't, you right. know, it was just like with us, it was like we weren't used to that. But, you know, it's to ma amazing to me that here you are in Miami listening to music from your home. Yep. And, and so you ended up moving back here to Mississippi. I moved back. Yeah. See, see what, what happened, I moved back, graduated high school, right. and then ended up going back to Miami after right. graduation. I graduated in 87 from Kenton High. Yeah. But my 11th grade year, I went to Miami Edison. So I was able to get that experience, which I really enjoyed that experience. Yeah. But after I moved back, you know, went back, you know, experimenting on different things, you know, like you say with boxing, I used to go to Miami Beach, the uh, the same um, gym that, that Muhammad Ali trained at on, on Miami Beach. Oh, wow. So I went there, I spent a little time, and then I figured out that I didn't want to spend a life, you know, even though you can fight, yeah. but even taking that one or two shots in the nose or whatever, because I see some people with some jacked up noses. <laughs> exactly, and it hurts a lot less to be a musician. That's right, to be a, give me a microphone. Exactly. Keep the gloves, give me a microphone. You, you play the harmonica really, really well. Yeah. Talk about that learning experience, because I mean, I mean, I play a little bit of harmonica too, and it's it was something like for you know I just drive around playing and stuff like that. You you kind of have it in your pocket all the time. Is that kind of how you learned? Well, really, what I did, um, I was watching. I think it was um, I don't know what TV show it was, but I was watching it in in the ninety, probably about ninety three or so. Yeah. And I, I was listening to a doctor say that the mind never sleep, the brain never sleep. Mm -hmm. So when I got into Sonny Boy and wanted to play the harmonica, yeah. I used to sleep with his CD just constantly going all night long because I was thinking, well, he say your brain never sleeps, so maybe right. I can pick some stuff up. Exactly. And it did help me grow more because I'd be playing and messing around with it, and I can hear like certain licks of places that go on it mm -hmm. and don't know how to pick that up. So I think it actually works. You know, you can learn while you sleep if you're listening. Talk a little bit about it. Mean, you know, there's a lot of people watching right now that want to be overnight successes. Yeah. And they want to get into the music business and everything else. Do you have any advice for them? Well, there's, there's well, no such thing as an overnight success. Not if you're going to do it the do right it, way. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I mean, I, but when I came in to, let's say, like with the blues leading, you know, uh, leaving rap, I knew I had a lot of work to do. Right. Because I was like behind. Now, I got into traditional blues and in the 90s. It was two young men that was African American that were doing traditional blues. And one was in Mississippi and one was in Florida. And that was Grady Champion and mm -hmm. Eddie Cotton. That's right. We were young cats. And we were, our heart just was stuck on it. When I heard that chess record stuff, see, we never used to hear chess records songs that was traditional yeah. in Mississippi. Because, like I say, it was more, you know, the Malico, the soul sure. blues. Mm -hmm. But when I heard that, man, it was just some just like touch you. Even though the guys that we were listening to was actually from Mississippi Muddy Water, Willie Dixon, uh, you know, Sonny Boy Williamson. These guys was actually from Mississippi, so. Right, and you were coming into a time when they're still alive. A lot of them are, so you could, did well, you get a chance to actually well, meet some of them? I mean, cause, Junior Wells, yeah. I met Junior Wells and uh, Coco Taylor, you know, guys like that, but yeah. you know, Muddy, Muddy had passed on, oh, yeah. Howlin' Wolf had passed right. on, you know, cause Muddy, I think in 83, Howlin' Wolf was like 76 or seven, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, some of them had moved on cause I'm a big Howlin' Wolf fan as well, but, it was enough that, man, I couldn't see myself doing nothing else. It was right. just so happened that I got the training on the business side. Right. And I think a lot of people kind of was like, you know, you're too much on business. You focus too much on mm -hmm. business. But it's just something that I love. I love business. I love playing. And I love being around good people. Exactly. And that's, that's something you and I have talked about before in the past. When you have people that work with you or in your band, you have pretty high standards for them, don't that's you? That's right. Yeah. And, and, and it make difficult, it's difficult sometimes for younger people. Yeah. Because I don't kind of get away from what 
you know, I have set. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, we don't be with the, you know, the, the drinking people, get people thinking that you got to drink to play. You don't have right. to drink to play. It's in your soul. You got, if you want to drink, drink because you want to drink and chill. Right. But don't think you have to do it to make you perform better or be better because you don't have to do that. And, you know, and I run it where it's just like if you come out to see me play, I don't mm. think you should come up and you got, uh, a band sitting there smashed on stage <laughs> and you coming out to enjoy yourself. You done right. paid your money to come in and enjoy yourself. I've, I've seen you perform before. I mean, you are you are the consummate professional. You are trying to give each person in that audience That's something right. special. My mama always told me, she, when I was little, mama used to whoop me all the time. She called it clowning around. But she always told me I had the ability to touch people. Yeah. And and I and I think that's from the realness, you know. I try to always be real with people, and not saying I'm always right, cause right. cause I'm wrong, but I'm not afraid to sit back. And say, okay, I was wrong about that situation, but I just try to be real. If I'm gonna do it, if I'm gonna do it wrong, it's gonna be wrong from my heart. Yeah. If I'm gonna do it right, it's gonna be right from my heart, and that's the only way I know how to operate. You are the next generation of blues players, right. obviously, and I, and I remember taking my boys up to the BB King Museum, and you know you get a complete idea where the blues come from. That's you know, right. you understand where he came from. You understand exactly. For Grady Champion, where does your music come from? Well, I, I think about writing this album right here. Yeah. You know, it, because that's the most recent thing. Mm -hmm. It just. I had a lot of emotions going on in the beginning of the year. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I said, I took a little time off because I need to take time off. Yeah. I've been grinding for like over five years. You know, when I say grinding, I mean you out there just, you know, from from uh, Chicago to Canada to all these different places. And that take a toll on you. Yeah, it does. You know what I'm saying? So, but I, I really believe this was my best record writing. Yeah. Because I was able to take those emotions and even the negative emotions that was in there, I was able to turn them to something positive. And that was the key to this record right here. What some of that some of the songs on here, of course you got Bump and Grind, Heels and Hips, House Party, Life Support, Thin Line, Stone, One of a Kind. That's one of, one the, of kind. the kinds the first one that you that's released. Right. And that's important and to get it well, out there on the radio. The first one what we released though was um Move something. Okay. Now, one of a kind. It was the title track to the album. It's a ballad. You yeah. Know? Okay. I, I've never been a ballad singer. Yeah. That's so I, I wanted to give it a shot, and I, I really think um, that song, one of a kind. They call it one of a kind love affair. Yeah. Call in, in some sense, if it's not just a romantic love affair, you got so many people that spend their whole life trying to find that one of a kind love affair. Mm -hmm. Even if it's with your father or if it's with your mother, you know what I'm saying, when you don't have that connection. So that all came into me writing this song, even though I was able to get it across as a man and woman relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's deal with any relationship because we're always looking for it if we don't have it. Right. And, and a lot of people make a lot of mistakes trying to find that one of a kind love affair. You know, one thing about your songs, and I've noticed this in the last couple of albums you've done, you start kind of at the base with blues, that's and right. then you can go all kinds of different directions that's just right. by having that as the foundation. That's right? right. Yeah. Well, that's all music. That's what kind of shocked me when I deal with, uh, uh, you know, come around to programmers on yeah. radio. They said, well, it's a good song, but I hear too much blues in it. Well, dude, yeah. don't you know blues is, is right. what those songs you're hearing came from? Exactly. So, and, and that, that kind of like kind of confuses me because if it's a good song, it's a good song. Exactly. If it's not a good song, it's not a good song. If it got blues, rock, country, it don't make a difference. It's a good song, it's a good song. I mean, how many famous British rockers out there completely <laughs> ripped off the blues? Straight blues. Exactly. Straight blues. Yeah. I mean, backdoor man from uh, what the what the Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin, backdoor man, and uh, and and the arena always had so much respect for the people like the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Cause they always let people knew let people know where did they get it from. I got it from here. Right. I heard Muddy Water song, Rolling Stones. So. Yeah. And they also I elevated those Rolling guys Stone. too. That's they had, right. They had them as their they opening went, acts. They went back. Yeah. And helped the guys that they really looked up to. And it's so having no guys from across the water, crossing Europe. You know, we go to Europe, we have a ball. That's the thing, and you know, you go into the museums all around Mississippi, the Blues Museums, and you look at the guest books. That's right. And they're all from Europe. And yeah. so you're over in Europe, you get treated like a king over oh, there, yeah. don't you? Oh we go, yeah, we going over there, uh, we're gonna leave November the 13th. Yeah. And uh, we'll be over there for a month. But I done been over there like four, five, six times. But it, it just, it, it just, uh, it's something else, that the respect that they have for this music. Yeah. And just for innovators, when right. I say innovators with music, with blues, see a lot of people want to stagnate it. They want to keep it just like it been for the last right. 80 years. Right. You can't grow like that. 
So when they get young guys in like me, when I say young, you know, you, you got guys from a different time, a different era, mm -hmm. that bring in different experiences. Like I'm coming from the hip hop field. Right. You know, you gotta let it grow. See, but they, they more, um, they want to keep it in a museum. They want to keep the duplicators going. Yeah. But they don't want those innovators out there. Yeah. But I tell them I ain't planning on stopping. But think about it. I mean, you're talking about the innovators. How were you received when you get up in these contests? Oh, the fans love it. Okay. I mean, the fans love it. It's just a few that kind of like sit uh, on the head of this. You yeah. know, like you can get, you know, a couple of the, the guys that say, okay, well, you ain't going to get on my festival if you're not doing traditional blues. Right. Come on now. Exactly, but you can do that. I, I mean, can do that you, too. You, you can That's do that. Right. That's the thing. You get a lot of different arrows in your quiver. That's right. Well, I tell people that they're like when uh, I play my harmonica. Yeah. I don't try to play like nobody else. Right. You I, want, I want to be like Grady Champion. Even though I listen to Sonny Boy, I listen to Little Walt and stuff like that. If I wanted to play those licks, I can play those licks. Yeah. But I choose not because I see too many other folks that not being creative enough to develop their own style. Blowing everything leak for leak. I mean, I know a lot of cartoonists that way. They they pick up another cartoonist style and they don't ever move on. But for me, I started out copying right. other people, but now I draw like I did in third grade. That's what you do. You exactly. learn. Yeah. You learn the techniques. You learn what it takes to make something right. great, and then you build from it. Exactly. Exactly. You do have your harmonica with you, don't oh, you? Oh yeah. Yeah. Why don't you play something? That, that'd be awesome. Let me see so, if I can unzip my old horn of him. It's in a special case. Grady Champion, everybody. I got the whole studio audience going crazy now. <laughs> but that, that's amazing. You can, you know, because the harmonica is a pretty simple instrument. That's right. But you can take it and bend it and take notes and that's take right. it off into other places. And, oh, yeah. And then, you know, of course, you've been doing that now for what, 20 years? So. 23. 23. Yep. Yeah. And you, it got to be from the hard. Though. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I always tell people that learn harmonica is anything that's going on around you about that rhythm. Yeah. And listen to it. It could become a percussion instrument. It really can. Anything. Exactly. I, 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 you know, like, like a lot of people, like with a style of man, I'm going to show you one more thing with okay. a, um, I comp a lot. You okay. know what I'm saying? I comp a lot. Like if I get and they'll hear a lot of that, um, wait, that. <laughs> just doing like different the course yeah. kind of like stand on no course when you are not just ripping off like you know you know just uh, let's say solos not just ripping right. off solo but adding comping in between you know mm -hmm. in that as well exactly you know exactly like, well, you of course write your own music that's right that's huge I mean you really basically the whole production you do I mean you've got your own studio you do that <laughs> you do the writing that's important in it that's right that's it, right it's really good to have a whole piece a little piece of everything well, understanding and then I can on this album I yeah. co-wrote with Eddie Codden and I co-wrote with, with uh, Gerald Robinson yeah. because I wanted, you know, other other flavors exactly. into what I'm doing. See, a lot of people say, oh, I want to just write what I'm going to write. I'm going to write it by myself. Right. No, you write something that can be expiring, and you sometimes you get mm -hmm. expired by having someone sitting there with you that throwing an idea that maybe you didn't think of. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it just, it's, you got to be about the music. You get a lot of musicians. It's about the musician. Talk about, of course, you uh, have had some pretty nice accolades in your life. Talk right. about that moment when you feel like that your career really took off. Well, I'm going to tell you, um, it happened kind of quick, though, coming out the 90s because I had just started playing harmonica yeah. uh, in 1994. I started yeah. playing harmonica, and by 1997, I had recorded my first blues album. And in 96, I had uh, started doing singles and stuff like mm -hmm. that. By 98, 99, by 99, I was signed to a label out of out of New York. And and um it just 
being signed with that label in New York, it showed me a lot. You know, it really it really got things started because I right. was able to work with the producer and co-writer for Robert Cray, which was Dennis, Walk Dennis oh, yeah. Walker. Yeah. So that kind of got things moving. I learned a lot going out to, to Burbank, California, L.A., and, and um, you know, recording with these guys and mm -hmm. having Richard Cousins, who was the bass player for Robert Cray, play bass on my first two records and stuff like that. And I just pay attention to everything. But they'll tell you, though, they said, boy, that, that's a youngster, but he's strictly about business. Yeah. I didn't come in there to play. The second album that I did was called Two Days Short of a Week. Cause they were gonna give me two weeks to cut the album. I was done with it in five days, and I was ready to go. Yeah, and and I think that's huge because I mean, I, you see, so many people think that they're just gonna go and play and be discovered, and that's not how it works anymore. No. The, the music business has totally changed in the last decade. Well, you got now that you got you know you got like the Voice and America Got Talent. Those yeah. guy we can call overnight. Yeah. Cause they win and they was something was put together for them. That's a good point. But when you got guys that building careers, most like careers that gonna last. Right. They're gonna have a lasting effect. They did it the way we doing it. When you win, when you win, say a blues championship, mm -hmm. when you win something like that, what effect has that had on your career? Well, in 2010, when I won the International Blues Challenge, yeah. that's the first time in my career I was thinking about not doing music anymore. No kidding. Talk about a God moment. Wow. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I had. I mean, I, I had an accident trying to get up there, and um, I just say, man, you know, I did all of this, and it just. Just seem like so many doors are so hard to open when you don't right. have certain people around you. And um, but after winning that thing, I knew that it was something I was supposed to do. See, and I think it was um, 2000, yeah. September 2000. I was on Madison Avenue, sitting in the office with Avery Lipman, and because one of the marketing people from Motown Universal had saw me perform at BB King Club, opening for Coco Taylor. And so she came up to me. She said, when are you headed back? I said, well, I'm going to head back on Sunday. She said, well, won't you wait and, and come down to, to, uh, to the city on Monday? I want you to meet some people. And, you know, and I was sitting in with, I had just signed, you know, I had already just signed with Shiny Key, was an independent label. But I was sitting in the office talking to Avery Lipman, just like me and you. Right. And, um, and he was in with uh, Universal, uh, Republic, you know, Republic, you know, Universal Republic. Yeah. And um, he told me, he said, you know, you got something special there but you need to be with the big boys. Really? And uh, I never understood it until later on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But even that experience, I never forget it. And nothing, now, nothing never developed from that point. It could have happened then, but it didn't. So I never, I never just really, like, just kind of like, just, okay, you know, I'm going you know, to stop then. No. I but just a lot kept of people would have given up. I mean, yeah. seriously. I mean, some people feel like that walls are something to stop them, but it sounds like you believe that walls are just something to see how bad you want it. Oh, no. You, if, if I'd have listened to most other people, especially yeah. when I knew I was getting started. I mean, I was 27. Right. And I said I'd be about 40 before my boys mature into what it need to be yeah. to really, you know, make a move in this thing. So if I would have listened to um, people along the way, right. I would have stopped a long time. Now, I had a musician. I won't call his name because I'm not going to do that. Right. But I was 26 years old, and I made a call back to Mississippi, and I had sent this musician my CD. And that musician, that's a legend now, yeah. told me, you won't make it in the blues playing that kind of, your music is too serious. Really? And all it did was motivate me. Exactly. That became fuel. It came fuel. I mean, for every time you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to work harder. And I always keep God before everything I do. Yeah. And a lot of people don't feel, you know, I guess sometimes when you're on TV, you got to be careful because, you know, you get people, that, oh, you talk about God too much. But if you don't keep God before your movements, you're not going to move. Not in the right way. You right. might get somewhere, but how long is it going to last? Right. So, and my mom, she was a very spiritual lady. Mm -hmm. And she always tells us, no matter what you do, you keep God first. And even though when times got hard and you think you're going to fall off that ship, you wonder why you didn't hit the water. Something be done grab you and pull you back on. Or somebody be done help you. And I always looked at my journey in the blues as a journey that God touched a long time ago. Right. And he done placed shepherds along this journey to make sure that I didn't run out of water. Make sure that I didn't get too hungry and run out of food. But I know that at the end of this tunnel, yeah. I'm coming out into the light. And that's what I've been doing for the last 23 years. Family's a big part of what you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you've had family playing with you. You've had, I mean, you I you, had my son. Yeah. My son played with me. But it's just like, 
everybody, I got my resilience, I think, and my work ethic a little bit from my mom, a little bit from my dad. I didn't yeah. know the man, but I couldn't love a man more yeah. because when I hear the stories of the type of man he was, now he fathered 28 kids, but the most important thing, he raised them all until he was time for him to go. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. he was a good father. And he built houses that still stand on State Street. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's on like clay. crazy. Yeah, you, you yes. get on Yazoo Clay and they're still standing? Still standing. That's good. And and um, so, I mean, the biggest thing with me, I just said, if I couldn't be a good nothing, I want I would be a good father. What's next for you? Well, the next for me yeah. is I'm going to help develop younger people into real music. Yeah. You know, I can hear that talent. I got a, a young lady that I just met. She's about seven years old now. But I can hear in her voice she got something special. Mm -hmm. So I would tell her mom, well, you got to do it. You got to put in little things because God then showed you she got the talent to be special in something. So you got to nurture it, not force it, but nurture it. You don't force feed her. But you, 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 you do that, you're going to watch her grow to something special and teach her what she need to know growing because you know this could be a bad business if you're not prepared for it. Right. It could be bad. But if you got the right morals and understand the value of who you are, then you can be successful in it. But when you lose that value of who you are, they're going to eat you up. The new album, of course, is one of a kind. Grady Champion, thank you for joining us today on Con Conversations. Always. <laughs> <laughs>